All right. Well, it is right at 3 p.m., so um, we will go ahead and kick things off. So welcome to those of you who are attending uh, the first uh, webinar for um, 2022 related to education. Uh, for those of you who have attended webinars with us in the past, you know that we have had an ongoing webinar series related to uh, recovery and, and hopefully um, making that recovery a bit more rapid. Um, so today's um, webinar titled Accelerating Economic Recovery Through Education is one that I know we've been toying around the idea with at TPMA for uh, a few months now and really um, kind of trying to hone in on, on what those key elements elements are to accelerate uh, rapid recovery. So um, I do, before I introduce our panelists, want to just go over a couple of key housekeeping items. Um, one, the chat is always open, although um, we will go through a couple of the plan questions that I have for the panelists before um, we start really digging into those um, questions from the audience. But I definitely, definitely want to encourage audience participation. Um, so feel free to, to use that Q&A um, or even the chat to ask questions. Um, second, we do realize that there are a lot of individuals from uh, economic development, workforce, and education on this um, attendee list. And so we're really, really glad to have such a diverse audience here joining us. For um, those of you who have friends or colleagues who you think might be interested in this content in the future, we will be putting this information out on our YouTube page, and we will email you that link uh, after the, uh, the webinar is over so that you can watch this over and over again to keep uh, those key points that you may have um, you know, wanted to jot down uh, for future reference. And then... Just finally, we do generally try and get you all out of here right at about an hour. We sometimes go five to 10 minutes over if there's really, really good conversation going on. Um, but so we will allow for time for uh, Q&A toward the end of things. So with that, I am going to allow our panelists to introduce themselves. And so I think we are gonna kick things off with Carol D'Amico. Carol, do you wanna introduce yourself and give a little bit of information about your background? Hello, everybody, and, and thank you uh, for including me in this panel. I've been really enthused about uh, and, and being involved in it and the conversation that's going to happen. Uh, I'm Carol D'Amico, and I'm um, an advisor to TPMA. Most recently, I was the executive vice president at Strata Education Network, uh, a nonprofit headquartered in Indianapolis dedicated to forging closer relationships between education and the workforce. So my background is in um, higher education, workforce, career and technical education. And then uh, at Strata, I oversaw the philanthropy and national engagement. Excellent. Well, we are really um, honored to have you here with us today, Carol, and, and know that you'll provide some excellent insight to the conversation. All right, next, I think we will hand things over to Dr. Vicki King-Maple. Thanks so much. Pleasure to be here. Now, prior to, to coming to TPMA, where I serve as National uh, Senior Strategic Advisor, I actually served as a Vice President for Economic Development and Workforce Solutions at a community and technical college uh, here in Central Ohio, where I'm located. And uh, during that time, I also then operated the Workforce Development Innovation Centers and assumed oversight of our three uh, extended regional campuses, and then also managed community and government relations, as well as special projects. And I have to say, during that time, one of um, one of my great honors was also fulfilling a term as a national commissioner for economic development and workforce solutions with the American Association of Community Colleges, as well as serving on the Workforce Officers League with the Ohio Association of Community Colleges, both incredible organizations. And then as far as my educational background, I am prepared at the doctorate level through uh, which my key area of research and oh so appropriate for today's conversation uh, was steeped in the role of the community and technical college in bridging the workforce gap. And that was very specific within the engineering technology based sector that I focused my research. Uh, also then uh, completing the Harvard Graduate School of Education's Institute for Management and Leadership, uh, an absolutely life-changing uh, enrichment program. So again, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Glad to have you, Vicki. Can't wait to see what you're able to bring to the conversation. All right. And last but certainly not least, uh, Ms. Darlene Miller. Hi, I'm Darlene Miller. I'm the uh, CEO and Executive Director of the National Council for Workforce Education. And CWE is a membership organization. We're an affiliate council of the American Association of Community Colleges. Our focus is right there in our name, workforce education. Uh, we are practitioner-based. 
uh, and that we that our um, conference and all of our um, activities, our professional development activities, are focused on the practitioners doing the work on the ground. Uh, I have been with NCWE oh about twelve years now. Um, can't remember some days, um, but prior to that, I was a community college president, uh, community college vice president of workforce, and uh, a dean of career and technical education. So excited to be here with you today. Absolutely. So you may, our audience members may have recognized that each one of these um, fascinating and extremely talented women have um, something in common, which is they have backgrounds that span either education and workforce or education, workforce and economic development, or all of that in between. And so um, we at TPMA have the uh, mindset that workforce doesn't happen in a vacuum and that workforce really is key to any economic development initiative. So it's really important for us that we have individuals who also share those values. And so bringing you all on here, I think is gonna provide a, a really robust conversation. And so um, just a, a one other note of housekeeping uh, reminder for our panelists We'll go in order of um, how you were introduced to um, answer these questions. And then certainly when we take questions from the audience, um, you know, you don't necessarily have to answer all three um, of you. So uh, the very first question, obviously very apropos um, to this discussion, is how can workforce, education, and economic development organizations work together in an effort to um, expedite and accelerate the, the recovery that we are all um, clamoring for? So Carol, with that, I will um, turn things over to you for a response first. So that's what I get for having a name that starts with a D. Um, uh, so I think you said a couple of key words and that's working together. And as we look around the country, um, th those communities that are coming out of this very, you know, in a very strong way, do have a history of those entities working together towards a common goal. That doesn't happen everywhere, by the way. Um, and it's not just, uh, you know, knowing one another in the economic development world and the education world and, and um, the employer world, but it really is solving uh, problems, common problems and with common solutions. So I think the working together is a really key point and shouldn't be taken for granted. Second, I think the real issue that we're facing today, a real issue uh, in every state and, and community is, is getting people back into the labor force. Uh, in my uh, home city of Indianapolis, my home state of Indiana, uh, there's a lot of talk about the low unemployment rate. Yes, it's low, uh, but the other side of that coin is, uh, so is labor force participation. Uh, people are not engaged in work or education uh, to the extent they should be post, post um, COVID, hopefully post COVID. So getting people back to work, I think is really key. And how you get them back to work is, is um, a lot of uh, strategies. One is making sure they know what jobs are available. Uh, rate, wages are going up. So it's going to have to be something really enticing like wrapping the education around a job. We've got to get people back to work. And I think that's the biggest challenge we face um, in many communities today, especially young adults, especially young men. We're not engaged in work or education. A hundred percent, Carol. I, I heard some um, startling statistics around that this afternoon, um, and, and I won't bore the, the audience with them, but I, I couldn't have said that better, so thank you. I guess all these women could pick on men since there's <laughs> no man on the panel. <laughs> Absolutely. Too funny. All right. Dr. Mabel, do you have any um, thoughts regarding how we can work together for uh, that, that rapid recovery? Absolutely. You know, it's that 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 very point. Uh, I think first, let me set this up with a personal story. And this may even be perhaps a bit of a confession, if I'm being honest. So just right before the pandemic, um, I was asked to actually speak at a, a statewide conference. And the title of my session, it had actually been selected for me. So the organizers chose the title. And the title they chose was how schools can work with economic development partners. So I'm gonna repeat that for just a moment, how schools can work with economic development partners. And if I'm being completely transparent here, I was a little put off by that title. 
And so when I, I, I sit back and reflect upon, okay, why did that rub me the wrong way? And why in the world am I still holding on to this, you know, three years later and belaboring this point? Number one, I think it's because I'm convinced that we need to begin to recognize schools, technical colleges, community colleges, four-year institutions, our, our, our K-12 partners, and our technical centers as our economic development partners. You know, we are on the same team. It's not us and them. It's not even us simply trying to work with them. It's all of us working in tandem and respecting the process, understanding each of our roles, yes, but then also leading the change and leading that charge. And, you know, I was, I was looking up the definition of economic development because I feel like all of us have, all of us come with a different definition. And one of the definitions that I, I, I discovered, I think validates the point that I'm, I'm making. And that was economic development is the process, the process by which the economic well-being and the quality of life of a people are improved as accomplished through targeted goals and objectives. So if you rest on that, if you really lean into that, what we're saying is educators, education at every label or at every level really is very much a part of the economic development process. And then, you know, having said that, again, last last month, we saw uh, an article published in the uh, Ohio Economic Development Association jur journal that I pinned. And, and, and we called it economic development and educational leaders build back better together. And if you think about that for just a moment, building back better together, it was just a little over two years ago that we were all sitting in very similar forums and exploring solutions for mobilizing industry, mobilizing industry with education and policymakers as the urgency and the criticality of the workforce gap and the skills shortage was evident. It was already evident at that time. Now, naturally, those concerns have been exacerbated. And in this burden that we're feeling to, to, to rebuild and, and to, to rebound, it's heavy. It is certainly heavy. But I, I think the silver lining in that is that while heavy, it's not impossible. You know, something to consider, and, and yes, I am an advocate for technical and community colleges, but, you know, technical and community colleges have, have traditionally been located within the heart of actual regional labor markets. And this is on purpose, okay, folks? They were built where they're built on purpose and with purpose. And they deserve to be recognized as players in strengthening the industry network of economic and workforce ecosystems. And so when you ask the question, so, okay, how can they be more proactive in doing so? You know, many colleges and, and universities that we're working with even currently, they're exploring um, or they're strengthening their, their, their current business and industry engagement processes. That is key. That is a perfect starting point. You know, these processes are centric to, to, to gauging and addressing employer challenges and workforce gaps for, especially for those institutions who are concentrated on helping to fill those talent pipelines right there in their communities. You know, they're poised to, to place educated and, and skilled individuals into internship opportunities, into implementing career exploration um, and hiring events. They have the, the, the force behind them as institutions to do that. And one thing I think that they can't forget that, that, that we love to remind them is they can also be providing that necessary training for the incumbent worker. And that's really important to these business and industry engagement conversations, um, you know, being prepared with models to help also employers identify that, that leadership and advancement uh, potential within uh, uh, you know, the, the current workforce, providing them the necessary training for them to move along that career trajectory, you know, all the while then backfilling uh, that, that entry-level talent pipeline. And, and, and one more point just to this is, you know, similarly to those BNI engagement processes that, that, that we're seeing for, for uh, institutions, we are also seeing more and more economic developers um, who are bolstering their business retention and expansion models, their BR and E models, you know, they're discovering the, the, the benefits of more actively uh, involving the local educational institutions, involving local training providers, thus really elevating those parallels and, and finding those intersections between 
business and industry engagement processes and the, those BRNE models. So I think that's just a great starting place that, that we're starting to see happen. Absolutely. Well, thank you. No, that's, uh, that's definitely an excellent insight. Um, Darlene, what are your thoughts along the same question? Um, so I'm going to repeat the question just briefly. Uh, how can education, economic development, and workforce organizations work together to expedite a rapid recovery? So um, I think uh, Carol and Vicki made some really important points. Um, you know, um, I have been someone for years who have been saying, I don't understand why people separate out workforce development from economic development. I think they are the same thing. And when you listen to what Vicki read about the uh, definition of economic development, I think oftentimes we get too focused thinking about the business and industry reaching prosperity, when one of the important other missions and goals of all of this is prosperity for families. So it's not just about the business and industry prospering and, and uh, doing well, it's also making certain that we're serving our communities and our communities have access to good quality jobs and that they're also able to prosper. Um, and how that happens is through education. And we all know that education opens the door to opportunity. Without education and training, you don't get access to those good family wage jobs. And so it needs to be a constant conversation together about, yes, we need to meet the needs of business and industry, but we also need, need, need to meet the needs of the people that live in our communities. Um, I just had a thought, and it was a fleeting thought. It must have been brilliant because it's now gone. <laughs> Well, I have to tell you, you teed up the next question for me um, just just um, perfectly. So maybe that's what it was. You were like, how how can I make this an easy transition for Andrea? So <laughs> if you think of that other answer, um, definitely, Darlene, we'll, we'll circle back to you. But, um, but in the meantime, we'll go ahead and, and move on to the next question that we have for you all, which is which emerging economic needs are most critical and how should we be connecting classrooms or classrooms to, and then this is the key word here, real world work opportunities to ensure that needs are met both for the individuals and the businesses. So you teed that up for me. Excellent, Darlene. And as you think about that um, previous response, we'll go ahead and hand things over to Carol um, to answer that particular question. So what economic or emerging needs uh, or, or, you know, are most necessary right now for those real world work opportunities, Carol? Um, well, I like the term, hopefully I can say it, real world work opportunities, it's a tongue twist, uh, because uh, so much of the time, not everywhere, but a lot of times in education, uh, we put people into programs and we say, this will theoretically prepare you for something. It's kind of the hope and pray model. And I think that model is causing people to have a, a question the value of post-secondary education because they don't see the concrete outcome. And so one of the things that I encourage is that we really do focus the education on the concrete um, because People are not buying it, and the, the enrollments are down. They're down everywhere across the board, particularly in community colleges, even at a time when the tuition is more or less free for a lot of training programs and education programs. So something else is going on. They're not, they're not bursting through those open doors, and I think it's because they don't see the relevance and that doesn't mean that we're turning education into job training uh, sites. It does mean that people want to see the relevance to their lives and how their lives and their families' lives are gonna be improved by the investment of time, money, but a lot of time. And we know survey after survey is they're questioning the value. So programs that I like to point to are emerging programs. One of them is Go Pro Early, where this is targeted at high school juniors and seniors, particularly seniors. And just like we do in athletics, we encourage those seniors to sign up with an employer. And so at the end of their senior year, 
You know, they're saying, yes, I'm going to, you know, name the employer in town. And that's where I'm going to work on my career, get my education provided through them. I'm going to, you know, work my way uh, through a career path. We've got to show the relevance early on things like GoPro early, things like apprenticeship programs. Uh, but it's got to be tied to work because work is what's going to get us um, back on track. Uh, from COVID. And I think a work first model and Darlene may bristle at this and I hope she does because we'll, we'll keep this lively. Um, the education should be really built around the work pathway. Mm. Work, work fixes everything. Well, for people who don't have jobs, I, I bet they would probably agree with you, Carol. So, you know, one of the things that you pointed out that um, I, I was actually just joking with somebody about this the other day, you know, there used to be a time where it was it was kind of a joke when you had a degree and then you were working in an area that was completely irrelevant to the actual degree that you that you had. And I think to your point, gone are the days when that's acceptable. You know, um, people need to see that it's, it's directly tied to a career and a career path. So that's an excellent point. All right, Vicki, you're up next. Yes, so relevance, keyword there. And, and you know, I, I, I want to focus in on that, um, you know, connecting classrooms for a moment. So relevance, yes, but then also we have to compete for the attention of these students, we being the adults, we being the um, employers, we being the workforce practitioners, we being economic developers, we have to compete for their attention. We have to expose them to what are these real world opportunities. We need to introduce them to the employers and to the industry and humanize all of that, not just in words, on boards, in posters, but true introductions. And we need to really, I think, create these experiences for them early on you know, just a, a few of the um, examples or, or, or illustrations of how I've seen this really effectively introduced in a number of communities uh, here in the Midwest is, first of all, it takes effort. I have to say it takes effort. But, you know, creating those, those bold experiences like Manufacturing and Technology Camp and, and First Responders Day and Manufacturing Day, um, uh, Healthcare Exploration Day, egg drop or, or culinary make and takes or, or summer camps or whatever it is that are the are, are pushing toward the emerging advanced and or in demand fields in your area, you know, actually host these types of events that introduce and expose the students to the employers and vice versa. And, and, and you know, when I think about those experience, I would say even hold the workshops on the actual college campus or directly in the career center labs. And I really emphasize that, that word experiences on purpose because we do have to create that. You know, think hyper-engaged, think full out hands-on experiences where, where students become actual crime scene investigators, have them learn to create electricity and get excited about those things. You know, one, one particular area I saw them teach um, uh, students how to how to search her on leather patches and on hot dogs in order to replicate how they can learn to stitch skin as healthcare providers. Uh, in another area, I, I've seen them earn um, have the students earn PPE, uh, 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 personal protective equipment like hard hats and goggles and safety vests by completing actual safety standard sessions. So I, I say all of this to say, again, in creating those experiences, don't expect that just touring hallways and looking inside classrooms is doing that. We actually have to have these students become engaged, become college students, help them to actually earn an actual certificate of completion or a micro-credential or a badge or something during our time with them. And perhaps more importantly, in that very moment, let's have them experience life as these professionals so that they can discover what is their passion, you know, life as a little mini paramedic or, or take them directly into the field with, with canine cops or fire up the, the, the 3D printer or those cobots and have them actually create something really cool and innovative with their own minds and with their hands, um, you know, creating them 
engineers that, that, that learn how to track and report, for example, um, um, how many toothpicks or how much glue it might take to complete a toothpick bridge and, and how much pressure that bridge can withstand before it crumbles, you know, introduce them to as, as little mini consultants uh, and entrepreneurs, uh, introducing them to business owners so that they can actually help these business owners craft social media and, and promotional strategies and business plans or, or place them there in the kitchen, rolling dough, making puff pastries, whatever it is, uh, somewhere else. I've seen it really effective taking them into every wing of a hospital, even onto the helipad so that they can see all, they can truly be exposed to everything within that particular industry. And I, and, and I, I just have to say, and I know that I, I get on a soapbox here, but I don't think we can sell these young people short. You know, it's a different day. It's a different age um, from our glory days. And I'll, I'll speak for myself, you know, in saying that, that these people, these young people are so much more tech savvy. They're so much more innovative than I know I ever was at that age. So we need to harness that and we need to get them excited to use that and, and create those experiences that are gonna take them throughout that K-12 career as students uh, more directly, more seamlessly into that additional training or, or into work-based learning uh, relationships for those careers that, that do capture their attention. Um, so again, experiences, create experiences because that's what those students are gonna remember as they're exploring workforce. Well, I love that. So we have relevancy and experience. And, you know, we're seeing that a lot um, uh, in the work that we do at TPMA, where there are, you know, communities who are, you know, using accounting students to go do accounting for their entrepreneurs who, um, you know, might be minority owned businesses and things like that. So there's definitely ways that we're seeing a lot of overlap and, and, and really an emphasis on real world experience and Carol's word relevancy. So Darlene, what are your thoughts in regard to um, like which particular real world experiences and things like that, that we can lend to economic development and workforce for rapid recovery? So first I'll say, Carol, I didn't bristle. Um, the first paper I wrote uh, in my doctoral dissertation work was the utilitarian purposes of higher education. Of course, my faculty member, who was a former Marine with a PhD in English, bristled at me using the words utilitarian purposes of higher education. I also wrote another paper that I thought that uh, Cardinal Newman and John Dewey should have a fist fight over what is the real purpose of higher education. Um, so, and, and of course, my background is in engineering. So um, I see I see the world uh, education through a different lens than, than some other educators do. I want to take this a little bit in, a, in, in another direction and challenge you to think a little bit. Um, you know, the question is, is um, about emerging needs that are most critical. Let me tell you what we're starting to see um, in students coming into the community and technical colleges and why this should be of something for people in the economic and workforce world to think about. We are starting to see many folks coming into the skilled crafts areas, um, welding, plumbing, construction, HVAC, those areas. And they're coming and saying to us, I don't want to go work for anybody. I want the skills because I want to be my own boss. Um, I think COVID had a real effect on people, particularly around the areas, particularly around the issues of job quality. And so people are coming to us and saying, I don't, I don't care what local employers want because I want to be my own employer. I think that's something that economic development folks need to be thinking about and looking at. Um, what does that mean for local employers if people don't want to go back to be working for the employers that are in your community and they want to be their own employers? I think it's an important thing to think about. I think healthcare is an industry that you all need to be worried about. People are going into nursing, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and they're becoming traveling professionals because they're not getting paid the wages in their community that they can get paid if they live in their RV and travel across the country. I think that's another issue that economic development people need to start thinking about. And that was uh, when, we, when we moved out west to California, uh, we traveled out in our RV and we stayed at a uh, really nice RV site in Bakersfield, California, right? An orange grove, these beautiful orange trees growing around the RV. And 
right down the road from us was the RB and up front that had her credentials. She was the coroner for three counties in that part of California. She was a traveling coroner. And she lived in her RV here and she lived in a house there and she lived in an RV. So people are thinking about work differently and it's affecting a lot of industries. So you've got skilled craftspeople who don't want to work for someone else because after the pandemic, they realized that they didn't like their crappy job. And you have healthcare professionals who are thinking, I'm going into this profession, particularly younger folks, to travel and make money and see the United States. I think those are real issues for economic development folks to be concerned about. Um, the other thing that, that often gets said is we talk about work-based learning a lot, okay? Everybody work-based learning, work-based learning, work-based learning. And I will tell you, I will still say to you that I would guess that probably less than 75% or less, less than 50% of programs at community and technical colleges have a work-based learning component in them. Even though we know work-based learning is critical to preparing people to understand the work they're, in, they're moving into. But it's also critical for learning those, those workplace skills that employers constantly say, oh, they don't have soft skills, they don't have soft skills. And I refer to those, I call those workplace readiness skills. One of the ways to develop those skills is through a work-based learning experience. But what often we see is we get people saying, well, everybody should have a work-based learning experience, but employers are reticent to offer those opportunities. They're reticent for many reasons. They worry about insurance, they worry about time, you know, because remember employers get up every morning and they go to work and it's about the bottom line, time is money. And if I take on an intern, what does that mean for my bottom line as an organization? So I think we need to start being a little bit more creative. I think we need in our communities, policies at our state level and at the federal level that supports employers offering work-based learning opportunities to people in fields. So I think those are three really important things that y'all need to be thinking about, worrying about, and the trends that we're seeing in community and technical colleges. Darlene, if I could give you a virtual hug regarding the um, entrepreneurship and policies piece, I completely would. I feel like we could do an entire episode around those things. You know, um, the EDA and USDA and DOL, they had all these different programs out, you know, post-COVID or with ARPA dollars, and um, many of them excluded um, entrepreneurship from some of those programs as, as communities were trying to write grants and things like that because they weren't directly tied to jobs. So um, definitely rethinking our programs and things like that to, to consider entrepreneurship differently. Carol, did you have something you were going to add or were you? Go well, I, I just wanted to, to echo your comments, Andrea, about how important the insight is about people um, wanting to be more independent um, and what it really means for communities and economic development and educators. Uh, you know, I'm not um, really against these entrepreneurship programs per se, but I do think, I like the way Darlene phrased it, it's, it's in the context of a skill or, or pathway you already have. It's not right. entrepreneurship in itself. Right. If you've got the skill, now how do I apply it to be more of an independent contractor? But this has profound implications for economic development, for communities, because how do you make your place if people can really go anywhere, and I'm right now in Southwest Florida, uh, and healthcare workers come from all over during the winter. Uh, so how, how do you make your community someplace where people want to either go back to, want to stay in, when they can go anywhere is a big problem. So it's an intersection between education, workforce, and economic development in a way that I think um, we've got to start thinking, as Dar Darlene said, all about this new kind of worker mm -hmm. and ind independence that COVID has, has kind of catalyzed or really fostered. And for education in particular, for my friends who are listening in the education world, we have got to stop the practice of if you didn't learn it from me in my community college, you don't know it. Mm -hmm. um, that has, that practice um, has got to stop and we've got to have a better way of assessing people's skills, talents, and knowledge wherever they learned it and give them credit for that. And um, so I think, I think Darlene has hit on a very important trend that, that does transcend economic development, workforce development, education. 
and we ought to pay a lot more attention to it. So I would encourage you, Andrea, TPMA, to have a whole webinar on what does entrepreneurship really mean? What does it consist of? And what does it mean for communities? Absolutely. We will, we will put that on the agenda, Carol, for sure, and have Darlene come back to talk about it. <laughs> have Darlene come back. <laughs> Can I jump in and, and say and, and yeah. something that Carol just said? Um, you know, um, I would really like to see us get into a conversation um, about skills-based hiring. Mm, yes. um, I really would like us to get into a conversation about skills-based hiring because, uh, you know, we still see and I, I've done a number of, uh, I just, I did a, a, a study recently, a, a project for a college in Ohio. It was stunning to me um, that there were employers who were listed with job openings, who were on college advisory boards, who were only requiring a high school diploma for a field that they were in a, in a, in a, in a, on an advisory committee for, yeah. which I thought was absolutely stunning. But, and then you talk to the folks and they're like, well, but if they've got the skills, I'm going to, what do you really mean by skills-based hiring? And so, you know, and then how do we work together to help folks that have learned skills elsewhere and not necessarily in the college, be able to articulate to that to an employer? Um, not, oh, not having a certificate or a degree oftentimes means you have the skills. Um, there are still employers out there that list on all, every one of their job descriptions, bachelor's degree. They don't even know what the person does in that job. What are the skills that that person needs? So I think a, a real conversation about skills-based hiring and how we help people articulate those skills is another really great conversation. Absolutely. We'll, we'll mark that down for the fourth webinar. <laughs> Um, so no, thank you for the very thoughtful um, conversation. Uh, these are excellent, excellent points. And, and truly, we could have an entire conversation around um, just entrepreneurship because it is so incredibly vital. Um, so when we go back and, and kind of look at um, the economy and, and economic development as a whole, um, especially as it relates to the topic today, one of the things that we know is that economies that have higher post-secondary education attainment rates generally grow faster and are more productive overall. Um, so as we're seeing post COVID, you know, there's this huge gap in, in people who have either dropped out of high school or, um, you know, or maybe getting back into high school, they were maybe um, behind by a year or two. How do we take this current generation who maybe doesn't even see post-secondary education as being relevant um, and, and try and get them more engaged with post-secondary opportunities? And, and I'm gonna specifically um, maybe even kind of ask for a little bit of a um, twist on this where we do it from the economic developer's perspective perspective or even just a community perspective. I think a lot of times communities as a whole, they see K through 12 education as something that they're not involved in. That's only the, um, you know, the, the local education board or, um, you know, just something that they don't necessarily touch. So from a community standpoint, how can a community encourage that, that transition from K through 12 to post-secondary? Carol, do you have thoughts on that? Well, you know, every community, or not every, I mean, lots of communities have adopted the 60% goal that has been advanced um, since the early 2000s. And um, the President Obama picked it up and it was started with Gates and then Lumina. And that is a goal that 60% of their community would have a post secondary credential. And so that's very common across the country. There are slogans, you know, for, for these programs. And, and, and many communities adopted it. Um, most of them have moved the needle a little bit beside, because of it, but nowhere near the 60%. I mean, that's, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen nationally and, and probably hasn't happened in most places, even though they've had these goals. And it's because the goal was a credential. And I think we sort of lost the point. Uh, the point was to get people into fulfilling jobs, livable family wage jobs, to lift up the entire community. But the strategies were about attainment of the credential. And again, people are not, they're not buying it because they don't see what that credential is going to do for them and their community. And so I think we've got to stand back and, and say, 
that the so what, what if you have that credential? What credential? Why would you want that credential? What's it gonna do to your community? And then we need better navigation systems to get them there. Um, this, this obsession with people filling out the FAFSA form, like that's going to get everybody back into post-secondary education. It is not, it's just not. We need better navigation systems, better ways of getting people uh, in, into those um, education programs and, and shepherding them along the way. And I think one of the things we have to put on the table is um, the huge mental health issues that have been um, exasperated or maybe um, catalyzed by, by COVID. Um, we need better support systems not just for our young adults, but for our adults who are maybe been off work for two and a half years, taking care of children. They're just not, the switch is just not going to be just, okay, we're going to switch everything. It's back on now. Y'all go back. It's not going to happen. It's not happening. And so we've got to stand back and look at the entire community and think about how to support people to get back engaged. Those are great points, Carol. Thank you. And, and you know, that is something that communities can control, right? That that ecosystem of support. Um, so those are excellent points. Vicki, how about you? Do you have any thoughts about how we can kind of bridge that gap a little bit better? Yes. And, you know, oh my gosh, there are just so many layers to all of this. Um, so many layers. I'm going to take a moment just to go back for just a second and, and reflect upon that notion that we talked about a moment ago about creating those experiences early on for the student and creating those experiences for them during high school. And, and I want to speak specifically to really creating those um, interesting, relevant, educational, and, and training experiences that will ignite them and, and hopefully help bridge that gap and doing so through community partnerships um, Let's look at it from a funding standpoint for a moment. I'm shifting gears here in my mind for a moment because I, I, I as I'm thinking community partnership, community engagement with these students, you know, um, that, that can look different in every community. And I, I was just thinking back to, to a community-based grant that we had written um, for the college to purchase um, what were called... Uh, anatomage tables for, for each of our campuses. And now if you've never heard of anat an anatomage table, what we're talking about is this high-tech virtual anatomy dissection table. And they're programmed with these, um, what are called photorealistic cadavers within them, okay? And so we're, these are tables that, that they lay down, they stand up, they project on monitors, they're fully interactive. And for uh, any of you that can relate to my age, so this takes our board game operation, remember that board game operation, this takes it to a whole new level. So I, 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 I emphasize the community-based aspect of this because, you know, while experiencing something like that anatomage table for, for students or prospective students, it draws them in, it intrigues them and leads to effective educational outcomes, you know, tools and technology uh, like this, they also make quite an impact on, let's say, visiting parents. Let's look at alumni, elected officials, um, of, of course, our healthcare and science-based employers. So economic developers out there, hear this. You know, when you're thinking about how to partner um, or when you get that request from, from an institution or from another community partner, think about how important this is back to or through each of those avenues. You know, likewise, we, we had written a grant for a mechatronics unit. So for those of you who are all into to engineering technology, you know, a, a unit like this, it takes some creative lab positioning, you know, within an engineering lab, but things like this deliver up on their claim to, to enhance those systems level thinking, those, those industrial automation skill building, um, that, that skill building acumen that our employers are asking for and that really our students are craving, okay? So, you know, I, I, again, you know, we found just even based upon those, those examples alone, we found our employers really um, appreciated those efforts and being part of the pride or part of these pride points within those efforts because they were not only also preparing our traditional students, which are their future workforce, mind you, but it also then helps to elevate and expand then that, that, that incumbent labor workforce knowledge 
of, of all of those operations. So again, I, I think just continuing to connect students to the excitement of education and learning and for us as the adults, as the leaders in all of those spaces to be forward thinking and to be able to forecast and understand what are those advanced and emerging um, opportunities, yes, but then also to be intimately involved with the, the development, the mind development of our students so that we know what's intriguing them and what's going to take them along the educational pathway and into, of course, their career continuum. Absolutely. And, and that does really tie into to Carol's point too about the so what, right? Like, so you're giving them the mm -hmm. hands on and, and then they can see what the so what is. Exactly. Um, you know, I have to um, give my sister-in-law, um, she's an educator in um, Washington, D.C. credit. She runs a STEM program there and it's phenomenal because her kids are building like award-winning robotics. And you cannot tell me that any of those, um, she, she teaches women in particular, um, but any of those young women who are leaving her classroom, knowing how to build robotics will not be able to, um, contribute significantly, um, to the economy. So, uh, those are great points, Vicki. Thank you. All right, Darlene, any thoughts on how we can help bridge that gap between K, K through 12 and post-secondary? Well, you know, you started, you asked the question from an economic development perspective, and I'm going to take it from the economic development perspective and uh, quote Hillary Clinton, it takes a village. It's important for all of us to be engaged in this work. Uh, it's important for all of us to uh, make people aware of the career opportunities that are there. It takes all of us to help people understand um, what a job, what a job is, and what the job entails, and what they need to accomplish to get to that job. You know, community colleges around the country. I'm honest to God, I swear, every community college has like 400 students on their nursing wait list. I mean, really seriously. For, you know, I mean, it's it's just every you know, everybody. When you say to someone, "Oh, I want to work in healthcare," they say, "I want to be a nurse." But nobody knows what all the great opportunities there are in the healthcare industry. Um, and we really need to be making, helping people understand that you, to, to work in healthcare, you just don't have to be a nurse. There are so many great things that you can do that pay high wage jobs and really great jobs. So it's, it really is about taking the village. But I want to throw back at you a challenge because I think what's missing in this question, and I think what we really need to be addressing, is what are we doing about the racial equity gaps in our communities? Our K through 12, you know, worrying about our K through 12, what about individuals in racially minoritized communities that have not had access to the education and training they need or don't know how to get access to jobs? And what about talking to employers about the biases that they have in their hiring practices that impede people in our community of color from getting access to that education. So, you know, when employers say there's a skills gap or we have a gap, we don't have enough employers. And my response back is, what are you doing about the racial equity gaps in your community? What are you doing about making certain that folks have access? Absolutely. And Darlene, you know, um, we, we haven't been friends for that long, but uh, this time uh, about last year, we did a, a webinar um, and it was based on um, racial equity and economic development. And one of the key things that came out of that discussion, one of the panelists brought up is that less than 5% of our nation's GDP is produced by African-Americans. And that was such a stark um, figure for me, because, you know, when you look at the changing demographics in our country, we really and truly can't ignore entire swaths of the population and expect for our country to be economically stable. Um, and, and then just finally, one of the things that, um, I'm sure Carol's probably thinking about when you make this comment, we have a partner, um, American Prison Data Systems, that um, is, is bringing education and training into um, um, correctional facilities and things like that to um, also take that particular piece of the workforce on. So not, not necessarily um, racially involved, but more justice involved. And so to your point, I think there's a lot of um, populations that get overlooked when we look at that pathway between K through 12 and higher education. And I think you were add something else. So well, I, was, I was just going to say that I live in California now mm -hmm. and, um, you know, 36% of the population is Latino, Hispanic mm -hmm. in California. 32% of the population is white. So it is now a higher population of Latinos and Hispanics in the state of California. Yet when you look at the wealth mm -hmm. and you look at access to the jobs, it's predominantly white um, because of 
you know, so much in terms of racial inequity that's occurred. And so it's really important that we keep having these conversations because we're missing out opportunity. And again, I'm taking this back to economic development. If economic development is about gaining prosperity, and it's not just about businesses gaining prosperity, it's about communities gaining prosperity, we're not making certain that all parts of our community have access to prosperity. Absolutely. And thank you for, for raising that point, Darlene. Um, that's part of the reason that we have brilliant people like you on these, these webinars. So appreciate it immensely. All right. Well, um, I, I know that I, I do want to just um, remind the audience that we do have um, the opportunity for you all to um, ask some questions. Um, we actually did have somebody who included uh, a resource in the chat that I'll be sure and share um, with you all as well. But um, one of the, the key things um, that I want to make sure that we talk about a little bit, um, and, and I think we're going to end up only getting through three questions today, um, but I think this is an extremely important um, topic for us to discuss about how can states and local governments, so those government um, individuals or those, those individuals who have the ability to influence policy, prioritize high value pathways and credentials. Carol, to your point, the, the so what. So what is it that they can do to really uh, make a difference in their community and with the um, local education institutions that they are uh, a part of? Um. Well, first of all, we need to make sure that the policies are in place that facilitate innovation in how we provide education. Uh, there, too often, um, for lots of reasons, the, the old model of how we provide education that is based on seat time, semester-based, um, the, the curriculum that has been around forever, you know, you take the general education courses, then you move on to your technical courses, takes three years to get a degree. That has got to change. People are not buying it. We've got to listen to the customer. And we have got to get rid of our reliance on that model. It is too prevalent. And I know Darlene's gonna talk about all the great stuff that go on in the so-called non-credit departments and colleges. In my view, we ought to get rid of that term non-credit to the consumer. It tells the consumer what it's not, not what it is. It divides the curriculum into, um, into, an area, into areas that, that don't matter to the consumer, don't matter to employers. So I think the model we have for post-secondary education needs, and I can say this if I'm the age, it needs a facelift. And it needs, um, it needs to stop its reliance on the old model and um, be much more nimble, be much more flexible to the consumer and, and bring in the employer as, a, as an integral partner, not as an aside, not as an advisor, but part of the design and the delivery of the education. And I think that's the biggest challenge we have in this country, our over-reliance on a very old model. A, a very old model. And if you think about it, like our education system, the actual model that we're using, instead of innovating uh, around the time that the internet was being born, I mean, instead we doubled down, you know, I mean, we doubled down on test scores and, and all of the different things that to your point, Carol, um, don't necessarily translate. So I can see now, you know, why the, the, um, the end user and the customer might be trying to, to buck the system a little bit. Um, so Thank you for that that um, viewpoint. How about you, Vicki? What what are you thinking as far as um, how we can set people up for success from the the state and local level? Well, to that, I I really just wanted to give it a, a, a big old hallelujah to everything that that, that Carol was was mentioning there, and um, you know, one just one additional point I think to to make that in, in and actually as a as a bridge is that. My gosh, we do. We spend so much time trying to figure out, you know, how to connect all these ecosystems and strengthen them. And we spend so much time focusing on, you know, of course, the student and the employers as we should. But let's involve these policymakers. Let's get them involved in these experiences, in these conversations so that they know what's really going on. That is so critical. And then also just one other thing really quickly to um, to 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 Darlene's last point about you know, uh, various populations, you know, let us not also forget the, the, the new American population, the refugee population, and the fact that we can do better. 
we can do better when it comes also to reciprocity. And our, our lawmakers, our policymakers need to hear about this because we have droves of incredibly intelligent, incredibly experienced individuals that we're welcoming into this country. And we're not recognizing those, those educational credentials. We're not recognizing their experiences. And we have individuals who are coming here just so rich with knowledge, so eager to work, so eager to be part of this, what is their new American dream. And we need to make sure that we make it a little easier for them. That is a great point, especially amid a um, declining U.S. population in many states, right? I mean, it's it's just going to have to be an area of focus for us. So that is a great point, Vicki. Darlene, how about you? Any closing thoughts for this particular question? I don't remember the question. All right. So the question is, hang on just a second. Uh, what strategies do you recommend for states and regions to prioritize high value pathways and credentials? Well, you know, I, I'm just going to say that I think it's all about the partnerships that we build together. Um, I think we don't, we oftentimes work at cross purposes to each other when we really need to be talking to each other, not talking at each other. Um, I think we need to respect and honor all that we all bring to the table. Um, I, I will tell you that a friend laughs and she tells me I'm making up for being a jerk for so many years, but I have become such a proponent of partnerships between community-based organizations and community colleges because I think they add such richness to our communities. They help us understand the needs of people in our communities that we don't always understand. They help us with the support of services that people need when they're trying to get access to education. Um, and so I think, you know, it's all about the partnerships. We all have to be talking together in this, in this uh, space and working together in this space and not trying to work against each other. Um, we need to be at the table. We need to be respectful of each other. We need to hear each other's voices. And uh, it, it, if we're going to make any change, it's, it's we're going to do it together. And we're not going to do it alone. Man, it's like you rehearse these things, Darlene, because I, I feel like you just tee things up for the next for the next um, little segment. So did you did you have something else you wanted to add? I was just going to say, I, I just, uh, you know, we do a, 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 an academy for new workforce professionals. And so many of these questions are the topics that I address in the training sure. in the academy. Okay. Well, taking things full circle, you know, I mean, you, you mentioned working together and how incredibly important it is. And as Carol predicted at the very beginning of this conversation, it is those communities who are working together who will, you know, be ahead at the end of the um, recovery, whenever that might be. Um, so um, we are speaking of the end, um, coming up on the end of our time. I do want to give the panelists each just a, a couple, maybe 20, 30 seconds for um, closing thoughts or comments. And then also just to remind our audience members, this will be available on YouTube. If you have a question that you weren't able to get out today, or there's something that maybe hits you, um, you know, on the drive home tomorrow or something like that, feel free to shoot us a note and we'll try and get that question over to our panelists. Um, and, and try and make sure that you have access to all the resources that we discussed today as well. So Carol, do you have any closing thoughts for our audience, tips, important takeaways, et cetera? Building maybe on your opening statement, Andrea and Darlene's closing, uh, I think in communities, it is going to take sort of an intermediary or a broker organization to bring all these parties together. Um, the, the mental health, the career navigation, the new models, the economic development, it doesn't really happen organically. I mean, everybody wants to work together, but it takes, it takes an effort. So I would encourage every community to really think about that broker, that intermediary organization in their community who could be the hub for these kind of conversations. Because without that, uh, you don't get enough meaningful uh, action. You get good intentions, a lot of good discussion, but it's got to be translated into action. And, and it's, it, sometimes it's not who you think it's going to be. It's not your typical organization. It could be a community-based organization. It could be an outside group. But it's, you, you got to find that local leader and that champion. And that's not any one organization across the country. 
if that makes sense. Absolutely. So you need that driver and, and, you know, just kind of reiterating what you've said, you know, I've, I've been an economic development director in a few communities now, and, and you'll see in some communities, it's the chamber of commerce and other communities. Um, you know, it, it may be a local government entity and in other communities, it could be a church, you know, I mean, you just never know what that local organization is that is going to be that driver. And so that is such a good point, Carol, because if you don't have somebody behind the wheel driving this effort, it, it just stalls out, unfortunately. So that's a great point. Thank you. All right, Vicki, closing thoughts or comments? Yeah, it actually just reminded me of uh, a conversation, actually, that, that I just had with a uh, local chamber of commerce director. And, you know, she was she was sharing with me uh, the story about a, a mother who stopped her in the community, explaining that her son uh, graduated from high school uh, last year. He was hired uh, directly uh, into a manufacturing position after attending one of the local manufacturing day events. And so I'm pausing on that because here was this young man who was adamant. And I remember having a conversation with this individual. He was adamant about having no interest whatsoever in more schooling uh, upon graduation. He's like, no, 13 years is enough. No more schooling. But now that he's several months, almost a year into his job, this mother reiterated that, that he has discovered for himself, and yes, I'm using air quotes there, that he might just be able to, to move farther along in the company if he takes some additional classes, if he advances his training at the local community college, and that his employer is willing to pay for it. And here's the part of the story that, that really struck me. The chamber director sent me a follow-up message after our conversation, and, and I just pulled up exactly what she sent me because I wanted to get it right. She said, Vicki, here we have a local employer with a good employee earning a great wage. We kept a young adult in our community, and now he's looking to expand his education right here, his home, right here at home as well. It's a win for all of us. And I wanted to close with that because, you know, folks, that's really what this is all about you know, it's the power of these partnerships, of these experiences, of these collaborations, even if it is just one success story at a time, we're going to get there. Absolutely. In so many states right now, um, you know, they need every success story that they can get. So that is a great point, Vicki. I appreciate that. All right, Darlene, closing thoughts or comments? So um, I would say that I think uh, the most important thing that uh, we all can be doing is to listen and to listen what the needs are of both business and industry people and plus the people in our community. What is it they want? What is it they want to do? Back to kids, you know, high school kids, what do they want? What do they need? Start listening. And, not, you know, oftentimes, and we do this as educators, and I, I can't speak for economic development people because I never was one, but I speak for educators. We often think we know the solution. We just, because we're educators, we know, you know, we know the solution. And we need Say it to, isn't so, Darlene. I know, <laughs> I know, isn't it true? And what we need to be doing is listening more. And we need to listen to each other. Um, because I'm going back to this, it does take a village to build economic development. And, and this recovery, it does take a village. We need to listen to each other. I had no idea until we were having this conversation about uh, people coming back to us and saying, I don't want to go work for anybody. Um, I had not heard that. And that was new. And it's been, it was such an aha for me. And uh, so, again, we need to start listening. We need to listen to people in our community, listening to workers, what they want, and listening to employers, for what they want. All right. Well. This was a um, very rewarding conversation for me to get to be a part of. Um, I, I don't know about you all, but um, you know, sometimes you can, I don't know, kind of know that something should be a certain way, but having uh, this amazing group of ladies here to kind of articulate it and paint the picture for what could be and what right looks like has certainly been helpful for, uh, for myself. So again, I wanna invite the audience, if you have questions, uh, feel free to respond to our follow-up email. And a huge, huge thank you to Carol, Darlene, and Vicki for for um, your time this afternoon and your thoughtful comments. And uh, we'll look forward to having you on some future webinars. It sounds like we have a whole schedule already built out for us. So, <laughs> so thank you all very much. Take care. <laughs>